So, a spokesperson from the Sheriff's Secret Police has just handed me a note explaining that I am not required to attend the Murder Mystery Dinner Theater as I was here in my booth broadcasting during the time of the murder. Oh, um, they just handed me another note, but it reads, we don't know where that scientist is. Please let the scientist know he is required to attend. Now, look. <laughs> Carlos has been busy all day in his science lab, sciencing. <laughs> if, if he were even able to leave the lab, he would certainly not just murder a stranger without stopping by the radio station to say hello to me first. <laughs> I'm gonna call Carlos right now. Hey you, I was just thinking of you. Hi, I'm so sorry to bother you, but I've received some bad news from the secret police. Ugh, I knew this would eventually happen. They discovered that my team of scientists is studying geology, right? I know, I know, it's illegal. Mm -hmm. And as Francis Scott Key wrote in his famous poem, rocks are just rocks, mind your own business, pal. But I find geology so scientifically interesting. I cannot believe no, that no, they no, just- No, 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 it's not that. It's, there's been a murder, and the sheriff's secret police need you to attend the mandatory murder mystery dinner theater. <laughs> oh. But that is great news. Um, I love dinner theaters. <laughs> I, um, I took some theater in college, you know, so I can play like a bunch of different roles. Oh, really? Yeah, okay, so the part that everyone wants to play in a murder mystery dinner theater, you know who it is? It's the butler. Oh. Because the butler gets to wear pastel tuxedos and carry this pet rat. Ooh. <clears throat> And I can do, like, a really, really good snooty British accent. <clears throat> hey. <laughs> I would never murder anyone. Might I perhaps take your coat, sir? That's really a British accent. Babe, it is. Oh, is it? Yeah. Okay, all right. Mm -hmm. So, like, another great role in the murder mystery dinner theater is the rich heiress. Ah, oh, the rich heiress. Um, okay, she gets to wear this, like, tight black dress and pearls and a feathered boa, which you know I look amazing in. I do. I do. So the rich heiress, of course, she seems like the murderer because she always carries around this old blood-stained axe. But that's the thing. She only carries the axe because her mother was the owner of the world's biggest axe manufacturing conglomerate. And their family made a great fortune by chopping up people and taking all their money. Anyway, <laughs> the rich heiress has this glorious and smooth Romanian accent. <laughs> Please know that I will never murder anyone. Now go get me another drink, don't chop, chop. I'm kidding. <laughs> I've never been to Romania. Babe, it's a dead-on accent. Oh, okay, yeah. all right. <laughs> now, listen, Carlos, I'm actually really surprised to hear this side of you. I mean, I had no idea that you were such a theater nerd. Yeah, like, I'm a scientist, sure, but that's not all I am, you know? Yeah. Like, getting to act in a murder mystery dinner theater would give me the chance to be not a scientist anymore. You know, like, um, like, like I could be anyone. 
like like a train conductor, <laughs> and I'd shout, all aboard, um, or a pizza maker, and I would shout, all aboard, this a pizza. <laughs> um, or I don't know, like, oh, like a writer, and I'd shout, I am alone, so terribly alone. <laughs> Carlos, I, I think the idea is that everybody is just themselves. So that way the police can easily scan the crowd and find out who looks the most guilty. I mean, I don't think that murder mystery dinner theater is ever supposed to be fun. They are grueling exercises in abrupt and arbitrary justice. You know who I want to play? I want to play a librarian. Oh, I don't think that's you a very... You seem to be very interested in young adult sci-fi adventure novels. Might I recommend Get What's Yours, The Secret to Maxing Out Your Social Security by John Grisham. <laughs> that felt really good. It sounded good. <laughs> Thank you. But I would really, really need to work with the director, you mm. know, on how to get the pincers and all the long hairy legs just right. Ooh, ooh. And we would really need to rig up a pulley system so that I could fly around the room and then descend from the ceiling like a normal librarian. Oh, um, Carlos, I was just handed another note from the secret police that reads, No more, please. <laughs> Tell him he doesn't have to come to the dinner theater at all. But I wanted to come. Oh. Um... Yeah, it's no bother. Well, we will just have to put on our own murder mystery dinner theater this weekend. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, I love you. All right, I love you too. Oh, you want to hear my Steve Carlsberg impression? Goodbye, Carlos. Okie doke. So, the sheriff's secret police has decreed that they will not have Carlos perform after all. Despite the fact that Carlos is a great actor, a wonderful actor, quote, one of the most charismatic and gripping stage performers of his generation, end quote, is what I imagined they were thinking <laughs> when they sent me this note that says, hey, please tell Carlos he's not allowed inside the theater. And then they signed it with a less than symbol and the number three. Now, Louis, what about when we're not singing? I mean, do we still need to do a vocal warm-up? I, I, I'm only asking because I was thinking about taking up a musical instrument. Now, um, Carlos has been telling me that I should get a ukulele because it's, you know, easy to learn and he says that I'd look really cute while playing it. But I've been thinking about installing a pipe organ in our apartment and playing that instead. You know, I haven't traveled out of the country in a long time. I have half a mind to hop on one of those planes and head to Spitz again. Ooh, or even somewhere new. Maybe Carlos and I could check out a nice resort somewhere tropical. Oh, that'd be so fun. Mm, Martin is now weeping and crawling away from the podium, dragging his crumpled up sketches with him, spit and snot dripping off his face, forming a trail in the dirt below him. A tropical vacation could be just what we need. Hey, Poot. Hey, Bunny. Listen, Carlos, the power is out here at the station. I can't even do my show. I've been trying to get through to the utilities, but they're slammed with calls. Oh, I, I talked to my friend Maggie, who works there. She said her cousin has an extra generator we can borrow. You know Maggie? Yeah, she used to work with me part-time as a lab assistant. Also, Josie came by with her friends and dropped off some bottled water. Even John Peters stopped by. You know John Peter, he's Yes, the... John Peters the farmer, I know. No, John Peter, remember? The pharmacist. Anyway, he dropped off your prescription this morning. Oh, well, that was nice of him. Listen, since you don't have to work today, you should come back home. 
It's bad out there, and if you're going to get killed or possessed by one of the strangers, I'd rather you do it here with me. I'll make us some lunch, and we can play cards in favor of humanity. Oh, that sounds great, but I still need to get to the bottom of what is going on in this city. Intern Kareem pulled some documents for me that he says I need to read through, and I have some calls to make. The invasion by these strangers is a big story, and even if I can't broadcast it, I still need to find some way to report it. I'll call you later. You're so good at your job. You are too, Carlos. Oh, how's your research going? Well, I've been examining some of the places where the strangers have been spotted. I have a meter that makes squawking sounds sometimes, you know, and I'm uncertain if those last two sentences are related. Cecil, be careful. And if you see one of the strangers, just get out of there quickly and call me, okay? We've survived one at the station before. I think I'll be fine. Well, past performance is not an indicator of future results. But I love you. Okay. Bye. Here's my question, though. And it's an important one. So, Carlos, my boyfriend, earlier when I talked to him, I forgot to say... I love you at the end of the call. I was I was preoccupied. No no big deal. My love was implicit in the way we talk to each other. Love needn't be verbalized when it exists in intuition and physical contact. He knows I love him. But part of me wonders what if one of those rare times I forgot to hug him goodbye or failed to say I love you turns out to be the last time I have that chance. Lots can go wrong in an indifferent universe. I'll see him in a couple of hours, right? I'll see Carlos later. Right, Maureen? Carlos has locked himself in the lab with his team of scientists, working without sleep to find a solution to this crisis, as they found solutions to so many crises before. He wanted me to stay there with him, since within the proximity of science is, of course, the safest place to be in any natural or unnatural disaster. But I am a reporter. I can't not report. My town needs me to witness. And so I will walk through my city, and I will witness. I sent my sister Abby and her family to the lab so they could keep my niece safe. I called Carlos to see how far along he was in saving the day. He said that he wasn't very far along at all, and it was frustrating to him. He said he's been letting brightly colored liquid bubble in beakers, and he has been writing numbers all over chalkboards, and it hasn't helped anything at all. He even drew a structural formula for cyclohexene, but it also didn't help. It's like he said, this is somehow a problem that can't be solved with science, but there are no problems that can't be solved with science. Science fixes everything and is always on the side of good. I just, I can't figure out what these strangers want. They don't seem to want anything. You sound very upset, I told Carlos. You know that it's not good for you to get worked up like this. Take a break. Play some Bloodborne. That'll relax you. Okay, yeah, I guess, he said, but I knew he didn't mean it. He was going to keep trying to save Night Vale, and I loved him for it, even as I wished he wouldn't be so hard on himself. We were nearing a thousand, our mob, feeling invincible, united to save our town, a town we all loved and believed in, no matter how long each of us had lived there. Carlos joined along with my sister Abby, her husband Steve, and my young niece Janice. I was worried for their safety out here, surrounded by the strangers, but I was also worried for their safety at home, hiding from the strangers. I was worried for their safety always and everywhere. Am I the good boy? Said a different voice from right next to me. My brother-in-law Steve, his eyes locked to mine, confused. Am, am I the good boy? He said. I cried out, no, and held him tight. Janice, Abby, and Carlos all put their arms around him too, trying to hold him in place, keep him from being taken to the cavern, helping him to resist the pull of a dark and muddy hell dragging at him from within. 